Thank you, and good evening, Liverpool. One year ago, I told you about the beginning of everything and described how the universe was made in about three minutes. It started about the size of a golf ball and rapidly expanded to the observable universe that we see today 100 billion light years across. So this is looking at the other end of that story. So in a sense, if you'll excuse me paraphrasing Buzz Lightyear, we're going to go to eternity and beyond. So there'll be a little prologue, and then I'll talk about the future of the, uh, the Earth and the Sun and the solar system, and then be looking at the far future of stars and galaxies, and then we'll be looking at the far, far, far future and the ultimate fate of the universe. And to avoid you all going home thoroughly depressed, I'll have a little bit of an epilogue which might conceivably cheer you up just a little bit. So just a, another quick recap, the story so far. Um, I'm not going to go over everything I said one year ago, but yes, the universe started some 13.8 billion years ago. That's where the story starts effectively. Um, everything we see in the observable universe used to be a lot closer together. We see the universe is expanding, so we deduce that everything used to be a lot closer together. And if we go back far enough, everything in the observable universe was only a few centimeters apart back with the cosmic golf ball. And then that generated all of the protons and neutrons, all of the hydrogen and the helium that made effectively all of the stars and the galaxies that we see. And this story is about the fate of what happens from now onwards. So given this is a story that follows a timeline, even though I might be talking about different objects, whether it be the Earth or the Moon or the Sun or the galaxy, I'm going to take these strictly in time order, regardless of the topic I'm dealing with. And to make sure we know where we are on the timeline, I'm going to run numbers across the top of the screen. Each of these boxes at the top there, each box represents 10 times further into the future than the previous one. So in other words, we're talking about 10 years into the future, 100 years, 10 to the power 3, 1,000 years into the future, 10 to the 4, 5, 6, 1 million years into the future, 7, 8, 9, a billion years, etc., up to a trillion years. So a red square is going to go across the top of the screen there as we go through the timeline of what's in store for us in the future. And hopefully those red squares will make it just a little bit easier to keep track of where we are in terms of how far into the future have we gone. Because, of course, we are going to be talking about millions and billions of years, and sometimes it's easy to lose track of where we are. I'm indebted to the work of Adams and Laughlin, who published a paper where they published the timescales on which various astrophysical phenomena are likely to occur. And I've used their paper to try and get my slides in strictly the correct time order. And for anybody that misses something or doesn't follow something, there are printed handouts of the, uh, the talk for those who want to follow the slides again. So we're not going to start 100 years into the future or even 10 years into the future. Let's assume that we get climate change under control. Let's assume we don't have uh, World War III and blow ourselves up. One of the more interesting astronomical changes that's going to happen in the relatively near future, only 1,000 years ahead, is that the Earth is going to continue to slow down in its spin. In a separate talk, I talk about how we add leap seconds to our clocks in order to keep the clocks synchronized with the rotation of the Earth. At the moment, we're adding a leap second every few years or so to keep the atomic clocks in sync with the rotation of the Earth. In another thousand or years or so, the Earth will continue to slow down because of the tidal effects of the Moon, and leap seconds would need to be added not every few years, but every few weeks. Further into the future, we can't say what's going to happen to stars going supernova. We can't predict what is going to happen with any sort of accuracy. We can predict the slowdown of the Earth accurately. We can't predict when a particular star is going to go supernova. But various aspects of what the Earth is doing that we can model relatively accurately and predict what's going to happen. For instance, the spin of the Earth isn't locked in a particular position. At the moment, it's the pole of the Earth is pointing towards near enough the star Polaris, the North Pole. 
but it processes, it moves in a large circle, it sweeps out a large circle in the sky every 26,000 years or so. We can work this out from the historical records. Therefore, we can predict that at the moment the pole star on the right-hand side of this diagram there, the pole star is Polaris, but the pole will sweep out this circle over 26,000 years, which means in another 12,000 years or so, the pole star is going to be over here. The nearest bright star to the pole is going to be Vega. That means it's one of the brightest stars in the Northern Hemisphere. That means basically asking a boy scout to point out which way is north is going to be a lot easier in the future because all you have to do is find a really bright star. That's probably Vega. That's north. You don't have to tell them how to find Polaris in the sky. But apart from making it easier for Boy Scouts, what else difference does it make having a pole star that switches? Well, at the moment, we have a pole star Polaris such that we are actually closer to the sun because of the Earth's elliptical orbit in northern winter when the northern hemisphere is pointing away from the sun. But when the pole is pointing in the opposite direction, pointing at Vega, that means we're going to be closest to the sun during northern summer. So instead of the seasons being somewhat mitigated by the tilt being mitigated by the distance to the sun, the seasons are going to be more exaggerated because the hotter northern summers are going to be exaggerated by the fact that we're going to be a little bit closer to the sun. Any variations in the Earth's climate, which are a function of either the Earth's spin or the Earth's orbit, are called collectively Milankovitch cycles. And I'm going to mention that once or twice in this talk. Now we're moving 10 to the 5 years into the future. 100,000 years into the future, the Voyager space probes are going to pass some nearby stars. Remember, they were launched back in the 1970s. Uh, Voyager 1 went to Jupiter and Saturn. Voyager 2, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And they've been running for long enough now that they are well on their way to leave the solar system. At the top here, Voyager 1, in another few tens of thousands of years, is going to pass the star system Gliese 445. Voyager 2 is heading off in a different direction, and that's going to pass the star Ross 248. Now, the uh, Pioneer probes were launched a little bit earlier than the Voyager probes, but the way they got a gravity assist from the planets means that they're not traveling as fast. So even though they were launched earlier, they're not going to reach the stars any earlier than the Voyager spacecraft are. Pioneer 10 on the right here is moving out in the direction of Aldebaran, and Pioneer 11 on the left is heading towards the center of the galaxy. So in another 30 or 40,000 years or so, these spacecraft are going to pass through their first extraterrestrial solar system, their first extrasolar system. On the same time scale of 100,000 years or so into the future, we know that ice ages come and go on that sort of scale. Repeating cycles of glacial and interglacial, in other words, ice ages and the periods between ice ages, we know from the Earth's records that those tend to occur on timescales of order 100,000 years or so. And we also know that Earth entered, entered an interglacial period relatively recently. So in other words, the next ice age is due on a timescale of 100,000 years or so. That's, this is another manifestation of the Milankovitch cycles that I mentioned a while ago. It's a product of the way the Earth is spinning and the way the Earth is going around the sun. Still on a time scale of 100,000 years into the future, the moon is still tugging on the Earth and the tides are effectively slowing it down. So rather than having leap seconds every few years, which is what we do at the moment, rather than having leap seconds every few weeks, which is what I said a moment ago, now we're far enough into the future and the Earth has slowed down sufficiently that we would need to add a leap second every day of the year. In other words, the rotation period of the Earth relative to the Sun is no longer 24 hours. It's now 24 hours and one second. So we would have to keep adding a second every, effectively every midnight. Now, we don't know when stars are going to go supernova, but it's quite likely that this particular candidate, Eta Carina or Eta Carinae, is likely to have gone off in the next 100,000 years. It is very unstable. It's in the mid middle of the Eta Carina nebula, and most of that nebula, or at least a substantial part of that nebula, has been formed because this star is extremely unstable and very uh, luminous. We think that for thousands of years, this star has been blowing off the outer envelopes of the star because of the planetary nebula that has now formed around the star itself. 
So it looks like it has definitely started shedding some of its outer atmosphere, and we think it's coming to the end of its life and rapidly running out of nuclear fuel. So we can't tell exactly when, but on a time scale of order 100,000 years, we think this is possibly the prime candidate for the next supernova in our galaxy. It might be beaten by Betelgeuse. Here's a, an image of the sky taken from um, Prague. And here, the person taking the astrophotograph has artificially brightened Betelgeuse to give an indication of what it might look like when Betelgeuse goes supernova. Betelgeuse is at a distance of some maybe 600 or so light years, and it will be phenomenally bright when it does go supernova. It should be visible during the day for quite a while, it's certainly visible as a very bright star for many, many months after the original supernova itself. But supernova aren't necessarily the most dangerous things that can go off anywhere close to the Earth. There's a star called Wolf Ray A104, which is an example of what we think will end up as a gamma ray burst. It is 7,000 light years away, 10 times further away than Betelgeuse. But when this decides to die, it could be even more catastrophic than if Betelgeuse decides to go supernova. And that's because of the jets it produces. The, its death may result in a radiation burst. These systems, uh, Wolf Rayet stars and this particular star in particular, has a very rapid rotational system that seems to be producing jets in two directions. And it is thought that if one of those jets, which we're not sure is pointing at Earth or not, but if one of those jets happened to be pointing at Earth when it decides to die, there could be an enormous gamma ray release heading in our direction. And even at a distance of 7,000 light years, that gamma ray burst could be enough to, for instance, evaporate our biosphere and uh, kill just about everything on Earth. Now, it's quite unlikely that the jet is exactly lined up with Earth, but we might catch a glancing blow. If we're lucky, the jet isn't pointing in our direction by a few degrees, and the jet will miss us completely. But there are enough of these things around that we do really have to keep an eye on them. The Gaia spacecraft has been, for quite a few years now, mapping out how stars are moving around the Milky Way. And it's been mapping out, in particular, the positions and velocities of millions of stars in our neighborhood. Even though all of those stars are independently moving around the Milky Way, it just so happens that some of them are going to come close to us, not because they're gravitationally attracted to us, but simply we have our own independent orbits, which are all slightly different as we go around the Milky Way. As a consequence, one of our neighboring stars is going to get uncomfortably close to us in a time scale of approximately 10 to the 6, 1 million years into the future. Gliese 710 is going to get close enough that it will actually enter the Oort cloud, the cloud of icy particles that are gravitationally bound to our sun. And it's going to produce an enormous gravitational disturbance to the Oort cloud, and almost certainly it's going to result of a whole load of new comets coming in from the Oort cloud. At the moment, we get a comet every once in a while that, uh, get, that drops in from this huge distance, but with the presence of another star in our solar system, it's going to perturb the Oort cloud to the point where we can predict that there will probably be naked eye comets every month for a million years or so. It's going to make a hell of a difference to a solar system. And bear in mind, for a little while, whilst uh, we get this sort of close encounter, our solar system will actually have two stars in it, two suns, just like other solar systems we could mention. Not, it won't quite look like that, but it's nice to think that we will have two suns at one point. Now, still on a time scale of one million years into the future, this is clearly a picture of Meteor Crater, Arizona. I'm not implying that we can expect an impact like that every million years. There's two reasons for showing this picture. One is to look at that and say, wow, wasn't it lucky that impact just missed the visitor center? I mean, how close could it get? So, but the other reason for showing it is to remind ourselves that any impact on Earth is going to, be result, uh, is going to result in weathering such that even if the impact wasn't very old, well, it depends on how far back you go. This was only a few tens of thousands of years ago. But if we go back millions of years, we wouldn't expect to see any impacts, not because they didn't happen, but because weathering would have basically obliterated any sign of them. So we can only see impacts on Earth that are relatively recent. 
And you might say, well, that's true, but of course it's not true on the moon where things last forever. Well, strictly speaking, no, because even the Apollo footprints won't last forever. It's not weathering in the sense of wind and rain that we would get on Earth, but the footprints and indeed all of the other Apollo paraphernalia will not last forever. The moon is constantly being bombarded by micrometeorites. And that doesn't sound much, but over a million years, that adds up to the regolith, the surface rock, effectively being pulverized by a rain of micrometeorites. And that means the footprints will disappear. And even the Apollo lander and rover and all the experiments, even they eventually will basically disappear under the bombardment if you wait long enough. Now, 10 to the 7 years into the future, 10 million years, the pioneer space probes, Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11, both had plaques such that, remember, we're expecting these things to go to the next solar system on a time scale of order a few tens of thousands of years. So on a time scale of 10 million years, they will probably have passed through dozens, if not hundreds, of different solar systems. If they get picked up, if the space probes get picked up in the first few hundred solar systems, anybody who picks up the Pioneer will be able to look at the plaque and say, well, it looks like it came from the, uh, the third rock from the sun, and that's where the sun is in a sort of pulsar map so that they can find where it is in the galaxy. Beyond 10 to the 7 years, it might be that the Pioneer space probe is still going, but the plaque is going to end up so corroded and pitted that it won't be possible to read it anymore. You, you tend to think of space as empty. That's sort of what space means. But the space between stars is not empty. It's full of the so-called interstellar medium. It's full of gas. It's full of tiny dust grains. So if you travel for millions of years, slamming into this interstellar medium, eventually any material will get pitted and corroded. So if it doesn't get picked up in the first few hundred solar systems that it goes through, it might still get picked up, but the people who then look at it will not be able to tell who we are and where we came from. Whether that's a good thing or not, that's up to you to decide. On a scale of 10 to the 8 years into the future, 100 million years into the future, we can ask what's going to happen to, for instance, uh, a ring system like Saturn's ring. But perhaps it makes more sense first to consider how did Saturn's rings come to be in the first place. It is thought that maybe it's the result of the debris either from a moon that didn't form or from a moon that did form but then got pulverized by impacting another moon or perhaps a comet came in, smashed into the moon, pulverized it, and then it's the debris we see that has produced Saturn's rings. When you look at a moon like that, you might think to yourself, That's no moon. It's a space station because it does bear a striking resemblance to the Death Star, having this enormous crater here. But if we do a simulation, we can say, let's take a moon the size, roughly the size of Mimus, Mimus, let's pulverize it, and then let's see what happens to the debris. You might think, well, it just goes round Saturn as a little cloud of debris for ages and ages and ages. But actually, the simulations show what happens on a time scale. Look at the time scale in the bottom right. After hours or days, a ring system starts to form. In other words, the debris doesn't stay as a small cloud. The debris very rapidly gets spread out into a ring around the planet. And all of the tiny little bits of debris that are assumed to be maybe the size of sand or something like that, each of these tiny particles will be bumping into all of the other ones. So they don't stay in stable orbits. They slowly migrate inwards towards the planet. And that's been happening for millions of years to produce the ring system that we now see. And that means that the process has not stopped. That is an ongoing process. So we happen to see the ring system, if you like, halfway through its life. It's formed a long, long time ago. But all of those particles in Saturn's rings are slowly drifting in towards the planet. And material from the inner part of the ring is basically raining down onto the surface of the planet itself. That means if we were to watch it for another few million or perhaps a hundred million years, then basically all the ring material will end up on the surface of Saturn and there will be no rings left. So for those of you who enjoy the view of Saturn, make the most of it. It won't be there forever. 
One thing we have to remind ourselves about the solar system when we're trying to make predictions about the future is on this sort of time scale, again, of 100 million years into the future, we tend to think of, well, my app tells me where Jupiter is now, and it tells me where Jupiter will be next year. And if I dial the clock back, it can tell me where Jupiter was 2,000 years ago, if I'm interested in the star of Bethlehem. But we have to remind ourselves that although an orrery or a tellurian makes it look like the solar system is basically just clockwork, whether it's clockwork or motorized, we have to remind ourselves that actually the solar system is chaotic. We cannot predict on large timescales where objects are going to be. We can't even predict on this timescale not only where is Jupiter going to be in the solar system relative to the Earth, we can't even predict which planets are going to be in the solar system. It might be that Jupiter decides to kick one of the planets out. We know that in the past, or at least it's very likely that in the past, the solar system has rearranged itself because of the migration of planets into and out of the solar system in changing their distances to the sun. And on this sort of time scale, that process will continue. So we have to remember the solar system is chaotic, and beyond a certain time scale, we can't predict the future. It's like the weather. We can pretty much say what the weather's going to be tomorrow. No way can we say what the weather's going to be in a month's time. It's the same, same sort of idea. Chaos means that you can make predictions over short time scales, thousands of years, no problem. Even half a million years, you could probably predict when eclipses are going to take place, but you can't predict indefinitely, certainly not on these sorts of time scales. This is a little map of our galaxy, and that's where we are, the sun there. At the moment, we are sitting in between spiral arms. We're not actually embedded in one of the spiral arms of the Milky Way. We are sitting in between two spiral arms in a relatively low-density part of the galaxy. As the galaxy rotates, as the sun goes round the center of the galaxy, on a timescale of order 100 million years or so, things are going to change. All the stars are going to move around the galaxy, but because of the nature of how spiral arms are formed, it is calculated that we are going to end up in one of those spiral arms. At the moment, we're in between spiral arms where there's a relatively low density of stars. In 100 million years, we're going to end up inside one of those spiral arms where there's going to be a much higher density of stars. In other words, we're going to have a lot more stellar neighbors. At the moment, we haven't got that many stars within 10 light years of us. It is predicted that on this time scale, we'll have a significantly larger number of stars within, let's say, 10 light years of us. So what's the consequence of having lots of stellar neighbors? Well, there are a few consequences, two most important. One, we've already sort of mentioned. Remember when Gliese 710 came close to us? If it comes close, it can disturb the Oort cloud. If it disturbs the Oort cloud, it can produce comets and asteroids, many of which are going to be raining down into the inner solar system. So having more stellar neighbors makes it more likely that one of those stars is going to get close to us, and if they do, they're going to perturb the Oort cloud and result in huge numbers of asteroids and comets, some of which are going to hit the Earth. If we look at the historical record and look at the number of extinctions, we see spikes, and we see a few spikes uh, over a time period here of about 500 million years. So we get extinction-level events where lots of species disappear from the Earth, we think, because of more, most likely asteroid or comet impact, and it's happened quite a few times over a few hundred million years. It looks like every hundred million years or so, it's not clockwork, it's not periodic, but on that sort of time scale, we can expect another extinction level event. The last one was at this KT boundary, KT meaning the boundary between the Cretaceous and the tertiary periods. That's the one that killed all the dinosaurs. So an asteroid came in and hit the Earth, possibly because um, there was a lot of stellar neighbors at the time. And we think it's definitely likely that on a time scale of 100 million years, we'll be in an environment where that is very likely to happen again. We don't know how many species will be exterminated, but it looks like it will happen. This, of course, is just an artist's impression. We've got no idea what it's going to look like. Big, fiery ball of rock hurtling towards Italy. Uh, obviously bad news for Italy, um, but really, if it's a big enough rock, it'll be bad news for the entire Earth. 
species will be exterminated. That's what we mean by an extinction level event. It may or may not kill everything on Earth, but certainly a number of species will be wiped out when this happens. Not if, but when. Now, whether or not any of those species will be us, that is, of course, the big question. And we can't necessarily do anything about it. It depends how big a rock comes our way and basically how much uh, advance notice we have, whether Bruce Willis is on hand to go up there and destroy it before it arrives at Earth. But the second and rather important consequence of having a lot of stellar neighbors, if we've got a lot of stellar neighbors, one of them might go supernova. At the moment, we haven't got any supernova candidates close to us. In other words, there are no really massive stars that seem to be coming towards the end of their life anywhere close to us. When we look at supernova candidates, we're talking about stars that are hundreds of light years away. Betelgeuse, for instance. That's close enough to keep an eye on, but not close enough to worry about. 600 light years is a safe sort of distance. But if we're in an arm of the Milky Way, a spiral arm of the Milky Way, and we have lots of neighbors, it is more likely that one of those neighbors might go supernova. And therefore, on this same sort of time scale of 100 million years, when we're next inside a spiral arm of the Milky Way, then we have to worry about what our neighbors are actually doing. A supernova within 100 light years of us would be definitely a danger to Earth. 500 probably okay. 100, that's getting rather nasty. If a star only 20 light years from us went supernova, that could, in principle, produce enough radiation to end all life on Earth. And if that doesn't sound very likely in terms of, well, you know, what's the chances of having a supernova only 100 light years away? Well, it's happened before. We have records within the Earth, if you look at the Earth's sediments, we find a particular isotope called uh, iron-60. Supernova that have gone off within about 100 light years, it's calculated that anything more distant than that might produce iron-60, but we wouldn't expect any of it to collect on Earth. But supernova that have gone off within 100 light years in the past have produced iron-60 as an isotope of iron, and that has been found in sediments of the Earth. We know that it comes from supernovas in the sense that it is radioactive and it decays and iron-60 will decay or change into cobalt and then into nickel over a period of millions of years. So in other words, if we find any iron-60 in the Earth's sediment, which we do, it can't have been there since the Earth formed. It can't be billions of years old because iron-60 doesn't last that long. It only lasts excuse me, maybe tens of millions of years or so. So the fact that we see it in the Earth sediment tells us that supernova have gone off relatively close to us in order to give us a detectable signal, and the fact that we see the iron 60 means that it must have been relatively recent on a time scale of certainly much less than a billion years. It is not primordial. It wasn't there when the Earth was formed. So we know it's happened in the past, and if it's happened in the past, it could quite possibly happen in the future. We're now at 28 years into the future, and we're going back to look at the Earth again. Remember, all of this time, the moon has been tugging on the Earth with its tides, raising tides on the Earth and slowing the Earth down. So the moon is effectively robbing the Earth of its angular momentum. The spin of the Earth is slowing and the Moon is taking away that angular momentum and the size of the Moon's orbit is increasing. So the Moon is getting further away from the Earth. The length of the day, remember I said leap seconds to keep the clock synchronized? We have to throw away the whole idea of leap seconds at this point. There's no way leap seconds will do the job. The rotation period of the Earth has now gone up from 24 hours to 25 hours. Forget leap seconds, this is the time to decimalize the clocks and say to hell with 24, that uh, it served its purpose, now we go over to, what, 100 quarter hours or something during a day. The distance from the Earth to the Moon increases as the Earth slows down and has been doing for 100 million years. And what, there are, again, a couple of consequences of what happens when the Moon gets a long way from the Earth. One is the very sad result that we'll no longer see a total eclipse. 
At the moment, we can see a total eclipse because of the coincidence that the disk of the moon, the apparent size of the moon in the sky, is just enough occasionally to cover the disk of the sun. Sometimes the moon is a little bit too far away, and we just get an annular eclipse where the ring of fire shows around the edge. But quite often, the moon is close enough to cover the disk of the sun when the two are aligned. But if the moon is further away, which it will be in another 10 to the 9 or so years, the moon will be so far away it will not ever again be able to cover the disk of the sun. So we'll still get partial eclipses and we could still get annular eclipses where the, moon, uh, where the sun peaks round the edge of the moon. But we will never again be able to view a solar eclipse, a total eclipse of the sun. So again, if that's on anybody's bucket list, get in now before this happens. Second and perhaps more serious consequence of the moon moving away from the Earth, apart from the fact we no longer get total eclipses of the sun, the moon has a very nice stabilizing influence on how the Earth behaves. The Earth has a tilt of approximately 23 and a half degrees or so, the tilt or obliquity of the Earth. And historically, that tilt hasn't changed much. Records tell us that the tilt of the Earth has been about 23 and a half degrees, give or take one degree, for a long, long time. The little cartoon on the left shows you the sort of variation of what the Earth's tilt has done. It's another Milankovitch cycle. This is a variation that occurs on timescales of order 40,000 years or so. But if the moon gets too far away, the moon will not be able to stabilize the Earth's axis. At the moment, the Earth's axis is effectively fixed because the angular momentum of the Earth and the Moon are related to each other. They are interacting, if you like. If the Moon is so far away it's no longer interacting strongly with the Earth, then the Earth's axis can do what it likes. So if the Moon, it's been calculated, is some 25% further away, then it's thought that the tilt of the Earth could change totally erratically and cause wild changes in climate. In other words, the 23 degrees is a result of having a big moon close by. Take the moon away, that tilt could go to zero and the axis is vertical. It could even go horizontal and have an axis that points towards the sun. So almost anything can happen when the moon gets too far away from the Earth to have a stabilizing influence on its axis. So again, there will be wild changes to climate, regardless of what mankind is doing in terms of climate change. We have much more severe challenges ahead if you go into the far, far future. I said that when we look at uh, Pioneer, it's got a plaque on it, and in another 10 to the 7 years or so, that plaque is going to be unreadable because the plaque is plowing its way through the interstellar medium, and it's going to get corroded and pitted by the passage of the plaque through basically a very large amount of dust. It's like the opposite of a meteor strike. Uh, instead of the meteor strike raining down on Earth, these little bits of dust are just sitting there, and Pioneer 10 is going plowing into them. Voyagers same sort of idea, but notice we're now talking about much further into the future. It's thought that Voyager's golden disk will last more than just 10 to the 7 years. It'll last 10 to the 9 years. How come Voyager's disk is going to last at least, we hope, 100 times longer? It's been calculated that the disk, the phonograph, should be readable even a billion years into the future. In other words, the metals have been chosen such that this is a stable configuration and the record should be readable even a billion years into the future. How come this is stable for a billion years, whereas Pioneer's plaque was corroded after only 10 to the 7 years? Well, that's because the record is protected behind a cover, and the cover is going to take the full impact and that be pitted and corroded. So the golden disk is being protected, which is fantastic. However, the cover contains the instructions to tell you how to read the disk. <laughs> so we know what a phonograph is, we know what vinyl is, we know what an LP is, but is there any guarantee that any of the civilizations that might pick up this also know what a phonograph is? So the instructions are there. Take a stylus, put it in, spin it at this speed, and look at the vibrations that will give you the music or the greetings and all the other recordings, etc. And remember that, again, 10 to the 9, if Voyager passes through a solar system every few tens of thousands of years or so, after a billion years, Voyager will have passed through 
thousands upon thousands of solar systems. It will have plenty of opportunity to get picked up by some extraterrestrial civilization should they exist. If it gets picked up within a billion years, they might be able to read the instructions and then they'll get the messages from Earth. If nobody picks this up before one billion years into the future, if Voyager goes on for more than a billion years, then it might be that uh, an intelligent civilization that picks up Voyager won't be able to read the disk. You might hope that if you're intelligent enough to understand what Voyager is and able to capture it, maybe they should be intelligent enough to be able to figure out how to read the phonograph, even if they don't have the instructions on the cover plate there. On a time scale still of about a billion years into the future, the sun is not yet a red giant, but it's getting there. It's heading in that direction. The fuel hasn't run out, but the sun is starting to change. The sun's luminosity will increase as it evolves towards the red giant phase. It's been calculated that the luminosity of the sun would go up some 10% every billion years. That sounds quite slow, but if we're talking about what's going to happen in billions of years to come, going up by 10%, well, that's a lot. Going up by 20%, that's a problem. Going up by 30%, it's not long before you realize that the total energy reaching the Earth is just too high to be sustainable. It won't be long before a greenhouse effect kicks in and it takes the surface of the Earth up to a fairly balmy 80 or so Celsius. So in other words, it won't be long before the oceans boil dry. What we're going to do about that, it's again not obvious how you deal with that. Uh, perhaps the option is, well, leave the Earth and come back when it's cooled off a bit. Um, either that or you just find another planet to go visit and find another Earth Mark II. But basically we have to do something. Going underground won't help because the entire crust of the Earth is going to get uncomfortably hot. And the Sun is going to expand into a red giant phase. It's inevitable, it's going to happen in about 5 billion years or so. And as the sun expands, the surface of the sun is going to get closer and closer and closer to the Earth. And you might think to yourself, well, if the surface of the sun is going to get close to Earth, this surely is going to be a bit of a problem for us. And I think this might be the point where we have a quick tea break. Welcome back from the tea break. Uh, we left it on a cliffhanger saying that the sun is going to expand in a few billion years or so. The sun is going to go through a red giant phase and will expand. And it's been calculated that the size that we would expect from the sun by looking at other stars of a similar mass, the size of the sun will end up approximately the same as the orbit of the Earth, implying that the Earth is going to be engulfed by the sun. However, it might not, because yes, the sun is going to expand, but it won't necessarily engulf the Earth. Even if we calculate that it's probably going to be the size of the Earth's orbit, because the Earth isn't going to be there anymore. As the sun expands, it has a very strong solar wind. A lot of material is going to escape from the surface of the sun. The sun is going to lose mass. And if you have a smaller mass in the middle of the solar system, the orbits of all the planets are going to increase. So this little cartoon on the left shows what might happen. Yes, the sun is going to get larger, but as the sun gets larger, the Earth moves away from the sun. So eventually, the sun will indeed, very probably, engulf the orbit of the Earth. But that's where the Earth used to be. The Earth will by then possibly be roughly out where Mars is now. So the Earth won't necessarily be engulfed by the Sun. It's a difficult calculation to actually do, to figure out what's actually going to happen to the solar system. But the Earth might survive. Let's assume it does, just for the sake of argument. If it survives the sun going through a red giant phase, once the sun has gone through its red giant phase, the core of the sun will basically end up as uh, a white dwarf. The outer part of the sun's atmosphere will be blown away to make a beautiful planetary nebula, and what's left will be a white dwarf, mainly made of carbon. 
We're not sure what the pressure will be inside, but the pressure might be high enough that the carbon is actually diamond. So who knows? The sun might actually be an enormous diamond in a time scale of about 10 to the 10 years or so. But if the Earth survives the sun going through a red giant, it will have another problem to contend with. And that is, at the moment, the Earth's magnetic field is generated by the fact that the Earth's core is partially liquid. And if you have a large metal liquid, a large liquid metal core spinning, you get a dynamo which generates a magnetic field. But the core of the Earth is going to solidify on this sort of time scale. After the Sun has gone through its red giant phase, or on a similar time scale, the Earth's core is going to solidify. The Earth's core is not being kept warm by the Sun. The temperature of the Earth's core has got essentially nothing to do with the Sun. The Earth's core is molten because of radioactive decay of the elements in the Earth's core. And this will continue for many billions of years. But eventually, the, the heat produced by that radioactive decay will not be enough to keep the liquid core liquid, and the liquid core will solidify. As soon as it does that, we no longer have a dynamo, we no longer have a magnetic field. If we no longer have a magnetic field, we no longer have protection against radiation, not necessarily from the sun, but radiation from cosmic rays, which are significant. It's thought that maybe this is what happened to Mars. Mars is a smaller planet. It will have lost its temperature. It would have cooled down faster. It would have lost its magnetic field a long time ago because the core of Mars would have solidified a long time ago. And when that happened, Mars would have lost its magnetic field and would have probably lost its atmosphere because of radiation effectively stripping the atmosphere away. So it's thought that that's why Mars is the way it is, because it's small enough to have lost its magnetic field a long time ago. Whereas for the Earth, we're not going to lose our magnetic field for quite a few billion years. They say trouble comes in threes. Uh, we survive, perhaps, the sun going through a red giant phase. Perhaps we can survive the Earth losing its magnetic field. But then, but then along comes the third problem, if we survive those two incidents, if we survive those two incidents, what's going to happen? Well, Andromeda is going to come crashing into us. The Andromeda galaxy, some two and a half million light years away, we can now calculate is coming towards us. It might not be quite a head-on collision, but it's definitely coming towards us. And it's calculated that by, for instance, 3.7 billion years into the future, the Andromeda galaxy is going to be huge in our skies. You will no longer need a telephoto lens to catch it. You'll need a wide-angle lens to catch Andromeda. So for those, again, that like their astrophotography, Hang on for a little while. There's a wonderful opportunity coming up. Uh, when we go forward to 3.8 billion years, the galaxies will start to pass through each other. It is quite likely that no stars will actually collide with each other. The sun is not going to be hit by any of the stars in Andromeda, even though there might be hundreds of billions of stars in Andromeda galaxy. None of them probably are going to hit the sun. As the two galaxies pass through each other, there's going to be a riot of new star formation because of all of the gas and the dust in the two galaxies colliding. Not the stars, but all of the stuff between the stars is going to collide and merge, and we're going to end up with a huge mass of which part of it is going to be a whole load of new stars. In other words, a lot of the hydrogen in both galaxies is going to be catalyzed and triggered into new star formation. So galaxy collisions are not the end of a galaxy. They're not cataclysms that end a galaxy's life. You could argue they are a rebirth of the galaxies because of new star formation. So the galaxies are going to pass through each other and then eventually settle down and merge together. So for a little while, Andromeda will pass out of the other side of the Milky Way and we'll see a very distorted galaxy moving away from us, but then the two galaxies will settle down and eventually will be part of one huge, probably elliptical galaxy. We'll lose our spiral arms, which is a bit of a shame, but neither Andromeda nor the Milky Way will have spiral arms anymore, and we'll probably settle down to one large rugby ball-shaped galaxy. It looks like it might have two nuclei here. That's simply because there's a supermassive black hole in the center of Andromeda, and there's a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. It'll take a little while for those two supermassive black holes to orbit each other, and it will take many, many billions of years before they eventually merge together into one enormous black hole at the center of 
whatever we call this new galaxy. Are we calling it Milk Dromeda or Andrilke or I don't know. Uh, we've, we've got billions of years to think of a new name for this galaxy once those two galaxies merge together. So although it sounds bad, it's not actually, not actually going to be problematic for the Earth if the Sun actually does get ripped out of the Milky Way by the passage of Andromeda, all the planets will go with it. It's not an instantaneous process. It'll take millions and millions of years for the Sun to leave the Milky Way if it gets ripped out by the passage of Andromeda. And if that happens, all the planets will simply go with it, whatever planets happen to exist at this point in the future. At the 10 to the 11 year point, 100 billion years into the future, the slow dance between the Moon and the Earth, this transfer of angular momentum of the tides generated by the Moon slowing the Earth down and sending the Moon to larger orbits, that dance finally comes to an end. Because at this point, one day is the same as one month. At the moment, one day is 24 hours and one month is, well, one month, about 30 or so days. It takes a lot longer for the Moon to go around the Earth than it does the Earth to spin once. But because of this transfer of angular momentum, the slowing of the Earth and the speeding of the Moon, eventually one day and one month will be the same length of time. In other words, the length of time it takes the Earth to spin once on its axis is exactly the same length of time it takes the Moon to go round once which means one point on the Earth will always see the Moon in the sky. The Earth will be tidally locked to the Moon. So there will be a point on Earth which sees the Moon and the Moon will stay static in the sky because as the Earth turns, so the Moon moves as well. And it also means that on the opposite side of the Earth, anybody living on the opposite side of the Earth will never see the Moon rise above their horizon. You'll either see it all the time or you'll never see it. You'll never see a moon rise, you'll never see a moon set. So one side of the Earth will always face the moon, which of course is the mirror of what happens at the moment. One side of the moon is always facing the Earth, eventually it'll be true the other way round. This is just the same as Pluto and Charon, who have two faces to each other, and they are locked in this tidal locking, which eventually will happen to the Earth and the moon. This looks like a little bit of Photoshop. It looks like the Earth and perhaps a chocolate digestive biscuit here on the left-hand side. In fact, this is a genuine picture of the Earth and the Moon taken from uh, Deep, Space uh, Deep Space Climate Observatory. It looks odd simply because that's not the face of the Moon that we normally see. Of course, if we're looking at a full Earth, then we're looking at the illuminated far side of the Moon, which we don't normally see. That's why we don't recognize any features on this side of the Moon. But that's a genuine picture taken from a considerable distance of the Earth-Moon system. It's a reminder of just how small the Moon is compared to the Earth. You don't often see them directly to scale in a photograph because it's simply difficult to take. We're now at 10 to the 12. You see the red square is now on the right-hand side of the screen here. We are one trillion years into the future galaxies are going to start merging together, not just the Andromeda galaxy crashing into the Milky Way. The Milky Way itself in the center of this diagram has lots of little galaxies around it, lots of satellite galaxies, many dozens, perhaps even a hundred or so. Galaxies are cannibals, which means eventually the large ones eat up the small ones. So all of those small galaxies, all of those little satellite galaxies are going to end up getting um, eaten by the Milky Way. And we've just said that the Milky Way is going to crash into M31, the Andromeda galaxy. M33, the Triangulum, is going to watch for a little while, but eventually it's going to get sucked in as well. And basically all of the hundred or so galaxies as part of the so-called local group will end up merging together I've got a little icon there which looks like a spiral galaxy. It won't end up as a spiral galaxy. It'll be one mega galaxy which basically hoovers up all of the objects inside the local group. What's going to happen to galaxies on a larger scale? What's going to happen to galaxies at greater distances? Well, we know that at the moment it's possible to image galaxies, even, for instance, those galaxies that are receding from us at twice the speed of light, it's still possible to image those galaxies. This is something I did during the COVID lockdown in 2020. With a camera, without a telescope, I imaged a, a very distant galaxy which is receding from us at about twice the speed of light. 
it's quite amazing to think that that's possible to do with a camera from your back garden, but yes, it is possible. Of course, very distant galaxies, some, those taken, for instance, with the Hubble Deep Field, some of these galaxies are relatively close to us, and some of these galaxies are at huge distances. In this particular picture, a random patch of sky that was imaged by Hubble back in the, uh, the 1990s, we happen to have caught, uh, I think, a couple of stars or so that happen to be inside our own galaxy, but most of the blobs you can see there are more distant galaxies. But because the universe is expanding, and as far as we can tell, it will continue to expand, possibly indefinitely, even though at the moment it's possible to image perhaps a trillion galaxies, not with one particular image, but we think there are something like a trillion galaxies in the observable universe, some of which have been captured here by Hubble. Because the universe is expanding, at the moment it's possible to image galaxies that are receding from us at two times or three times or four times the speed of light, but there will come a time on this time scale of 10 to the 12 into the future where the universe has expanded so much that it will be impossible to image, to see any galaxies beyond our own. So it's sobering to realize that we are in a privileged position at the moment to be able to build a telescope to look out into the universe and ask the question, what's out there? beyond our own star system? And the answer is trillions of galaxies. But if a civilization comes along in 10 to the 12 years' time and builds themselves a fantastic telescope and does the same thing, they will see nothing beyond their own galaxy. They'll perhaps just pick up a star or two within their own galaxy. And when they ask the question, what is the universe made of, what is in the universe, they will come to the conclusion the universe is their own galaxy because they will not be able to see anything beyond that because of the expansion of the universe. The only reason we can see thousands upon thousands of galaxies when we take an image like the Hubble Deep Field is because they are close enough, even if they're receding quite quickly, they're close enough that we can actually image them. So, I said, back in the beginning of everything, when I tried to give a brief description of the very early history of the universe, it took approximately three minutes to make all the hydrogen. Basically, you borrow from nothing. That's quite okay to borrow something from nothing. That's perfectly okay by the laws of quantum mechanics. You make lots of stuff, you make quarks, and you use those quarks to make hydrogen. And by the time three minutes are up, you've made all the hydrogen that the universe needs. And that hydrogen gets eventually fused in stars to make helium and then carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, everything we need. After a trillion years or so, it's starting to get used up. Only a finite amount was made for a given finite volume of the universe. And so, at some point, there'll be no new star formation. Now, this is a slight aside. This is a hypothesis. Some people have said, yes, there'll be no new star formation because the hydrogen will be used up. But some people have said, well, are you sure you need hydrogen to make stars? Is it not possible to make stars out of something heavier? Could you not make stars out of heavier elements rather than start at the beginning of the periodic table with hydrogen and then build up the heavier elements? Is it possible to start with something heavier? And some people have calculated maybe it's possible to build something in which you have nuclear reactions, nuclear fusion reactions at the core of the star, but the surface temperatures much lower than you would expect from stars burning hydrogen. In other words, a red giant might have a surface temperature of 3,000 Kelvin or so. It's been hypothesized that maybe you can make stars with a surface temperature 10 times less. Maybe you could have a surface temperature of only a few hundred Kelvin. Maybe you could have a surface temperature of zero centigrade. Maybe you can build yourself a star with fusion reactions at the core, but ice in the upper atmosphere. Frozen stars. Now, no, 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 no. Not, not the Disney version of frozen stars. If that's the picture you've got in your head, let it go, because what I'm... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what I'm talking about is nuclear reactions, but very low surface temperatures. Now, this is entirely a hypothesis. 
A lot of people say this is rubbish, but it's an interesting idea that you don't need hydrogen to make stars. I think 99% of astrophysicists say you quite definitely need hydrogen to make stars. So if you are going to run out of hydrogen, that is going to be a problem. And given that we've reached the right-hand end of this, it's not quite the end of the talk, but we do have to just say to ourselves, well, regardless of what's happening on a small scale, what's happening to the universe in the largest possible sense? What's the expansion of the universe look like when we're talking about a trillion years into the future? Well, the answer is we don't know, but we've got a pretty good idea. This is the size of the universe on the vertical scale, and time scale is running across there with us here as now. So let me just remind you that now is where we are. Relative scale means simply pick two galaxies a long way away and take that as your yardstick of one, and we're just interested in how much the universe expands relative to that. You can see that there are various colored lines there, four different colored lines. Each colored line is a model of how we think the expansion of the universe changes with time according to how much stuff is in the universe. So each of those colored lines, you notice, has a different starting point. How old is the universe? Well, that depends on what's in the universe. We look out into the universe, we can estimate how much matter and energy is out there, and then we can perhaps decide which particular coloured line we're actually sitting on. We thought a little while ago, maybe we were sitting on the orange line. If there's a huge amount of mass out there, let's not worry about what the units are, but if there's a huge amount of mass out there in the universe, then there would be so much matter, gravity would be able to halt the expansion stop it and start to contract the universe. So the scale of the universe would go up for a while, but eventually would turn around and come back down again, and the universe will end up zero size in a big crunch many, many billions of years into the future. That would be the case if the universe had a very large amount of matter in it. But we don't think it does. The best estimates we can make by looking out into the universe and counting stars and counting galaxies and taking into account this mysterious dark matter that's out there. A little while ago, we thought perhaps we were on the green line, which means it's expanding but starting to slow down. You can see the slope is just starting to flatten off a little bit. So the universe would continue to expand, but eventually gravity would put the brakes on and the expansion would get slower and slower and slower. But in the last few decades, we've come to the conclusion that that closed universe is not what we've, what, not the universe we're living in. We think that what's actually going on is we are living in the universe corresponding to the red line. The best estimate we've got of how much stuff there is out there, how much matter, how much energy, implies that we're on the red line. And look at the red line. Not only is the universe continuing to expand, look at the slope. It's getting steeper and steeper and steeper. So it's not expanding and slowing down as gravity is putting the brakes on. Quite the opposite. It's expanding and accelerating for reasons we do not understand. We can give it a name. We can say, ah, the reason for that is dark energy. That tells us nothing about the reason. It just gives it a name. Something is making the universe expand faster and faster and faster. And as far as we can tell, it will continue to do so. That is simply a statement of our ignorance of what's causing it in the first place and not knowing what it's going to do in the future. But for the benefit of the rest of this talk, I'm going to assume that the universe simply continues expanding forever. I think we've categorically said it's not this universe. You could argue, is it the green or the blue or the red? Let's assume it's just the red and the universe will go on expanding forever. In order that I'm not here till midnight, I've changed the numbers at the top here. So I'm not going to go up by a factor of 10 in every box. I'm going up by a factor of a million in every box. I'm going up by 10 to the power 6 each time. Otherwise, as I say, we'd be here forever. So I don't know what we call these things. Is that a zillion years? Is that a gazillion? I don't know what the actual names of these years are. We're just going to take it as 10 to the power, a number that's getting ridiculously big. So where did we get to? We said, before we had this little aside, that the universe made all of the hydrogen in three minutes. But after a trillion years or so, the hydrogen is starting to run out. 
Now, some stars can last an awful long time. Our sun might live for 10 billion years. Some stars will live for much longer than that. Some stars will live for trillions of years. But they don't live forever. So if the hydrogen is running out, what does that mean? There will come a time when there are no more stars. There's no more starlight. The age of starlight will come to an end because all the fuel has run out and eventually the last star will die. The stars themselves are still there. <clears throat> They're just not shining. In other words, we end up with the husks of all of the dead stars still orbiting in their galaxies for a while. In other words, we're still going to have white dwarfs like our sun will become. We're still going to have neutron stars, and we're still going to have black holes. But they won't be shining. White dwarfs might be hot for a little while until they've cooled off, but there's no nuclear reactions at the core producing the energy to allow them to shine. Neutron stars, the same. They're just collections of neutrons. They are not shining. And black holes, of course, are black holes. Nothing is coming from the inside of a black hole. White dwarfs are only white because they start hot. And they start hot, but they will cool off. No nuclear reactions, so there's nothing to keep them hot. So they start at many thousands of Kelvin, but given a short enough length of time, very short on a time scale of 20 to 24 years, they will cool down, and eventually they just become black dwarfs. Given that they have a large proportion of carbon, probably by the time they've got to that part of their lives, they're basically just large spheres of black carbon. That's all they are. Stars will be ejected from the galaxy. One of two things will happen. They'll either be ejected from their host galaxy or possibly gobbled up by the supermassive black hole that's sitting at the center of their host galaxy. That depends on exactly where they are and how they're interacting with other stars as they go around the, uh, the central supermassive black hole. It is thought that matter will be funneled into that supermassive black hole at the core of the galaxy by magnetic fields. For instance, magnetic fields of a particular galaxy, it happens to be NGC 1097 for those that like NGC numbers, those magnetic fields have actually been mapped out by the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. That's the big telescope in the back end of a 747. It's been recently decommissioned, so watch out on eBay. You might be able to buy this particular telescope after a little while. It's basically a relatively expensive thing to run, and it's been argued that you don't need an infrared telescope anymore flying above the atmosphere when you've got things like the James Webb, for instance. So it's thought that these magnetic fields in this particular galaxy are similar to the magnetic fields in other galaxies, and basically matter gets funneled by these magnetic field lines and end up getting funneled into the supermassive black hole at the core. So that would be true of lots of gas and dust and also individual stars as they orbit the, uh, the galaxy on these sorts of timescales. It's interesting to note that we don't even understand what's going to happen to atoms in the future. On a timescale of order 10 to the power 30-something, we think there might be changes in hand. We know that at the moment, atoms comprise a positively charged nucleus made up of protons and neutrons and a whole load of negatively charged electrons buzzing around. But it is thought that protons might not be stable. They look stable at the moment, but maybe on these timescales, protons are not stable. It is possible that protons decay, uh, in which case every atom in the universe will fall to pieces. Now, the only atoms in the universe anyway are inside white dwarfs. There are no atoms in neutron stars. They're just neutrons. There are no atoms in black holes, as far as we know. We've got no idea what's in black holes, but it's probably not atoms. 
So if protons do decay on this time scale, then every atom in the universe will fall to pieces. But we don't know, even if they do, we don't know the time scale on which it's likely to happen. It's probably not before this time, but it might be at some point from this time onwards, the atoms will disappear. But it doesn't really make a lot of difference because even if protons don't decay, atoms have a finite life anyway because the only atoms in the universe are inside white dwarfs, which have now become black dwarfs, and they will survive for a little while inside black dwarfs, but even black dwarfs will evaporate to the point where there is nothing left. That's basically a quantum mechanical effect, which I'm not going to describe in any detail. So we'll be left with lots of objects such as black holes. There'll be a certain amount of light, a certain amount of radiation floating around the universe, but most of the matter will be locked up inside black holes. And remember, galaxy collisions, that's a perfectly normal way for galaxies to evolve. Galaxies are cannibals, so one galaxy will eat another, and generally the supermassive black holes at the cores of those galaxies will merge together, given enough time. And so black hole mergers resulting from galaxy collisions. We've seen that happen in certain galaxies out there with the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope. We've seen what we believe are supermassive black holes merging together because of galaxy collisions. And so the supermassive black hole at the cores of galaxies, at the moment we can see some that are millions of solar masses, even billions of solar masses. It's assumed that if they keep colliding with each other and keep merging, there's no reason why these black holes don't grow into absolute monsters of trillions of solar masses as time goes by. But even black holes are not eternal. Black holes do not last forever. Black holes evaporate. We can't prove that at the moment because we can't watch a black hole evaporating. But Stephen Hawking came up with a hypothesis, which most scientists seem to agree with, which says that there are reasons why black holes evaporate. Of course, you have to wait for an incredibly long time, which is why this red square is getting a ridiculous distance along this timeline. So what does Hawking say is actually happening that allows black holes to evaporate? Well, there are certain rules, certain laws of physics that apply on the smallest of scales, we call it quantum mechanics, which tells us how particles behave, and specifically about matter and antimatter, particles and their mirror images, if you like, antiparticles. They can be created from energy, which you can borrow from nothing. You can borrow from the bank of nothing, make matter and antimatter, as long as you pay back the loan relatively quickly. In other words, you can borrow some energy, make a couple of particles and antiparticles, and then they annihilate with each other, generate energy, and you're back to where you started from again. This process, borrow some energy, make matter and antimatter, let them annihilate, back comes the energy again. That process, as far as we can tell, is happening all the time. And the question that Hawking asked himself is, well, if that's happening all the time, what if it happened close to a black hole? In other words, if we think about particle-antiparticle creation just outside the event horizon of a black hole, imagine that's the event horizon, so the black hole is inside that circle, what if you borrow energy from nothing and make some stuff and a particle and an antiparticle are generated, one of them falls into the black hole, but the other one doesn't? It looks like something has come out of the black hole because something now can't disappear. It can't annihilate with its partner because its partner is no longer accessible because the partner is now inside the black hole. So when you do the maths, it looks like something has left the black hole. It's actually coming from just outside the event horizon, but you can treat it as if the black hole has radiated something, whether it be particles or whether it be a certain amount of energy. And the net flux of particles radiated from the event horizon of a black hole is now called Hawking radiation. Hawking proposed it. A lot of scientists think it must happen. No proof. We haven't seen it, but it seems to explain a lot about how black holes behave. The radiation increases with decreasing mass. In other words, very large black holes don't radiate much. Very small black holes radiate substantial amounts of energy. So small black holes evaporate faster than larger ones. So if you watch a black hole evaporating, to start with, it seems to be evaporating very, very slowly and slowly losing mass. 
But as its mass gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the radiation gets faster and faster and faster. So the radiation is initially very sluggish, but it's not too long before the black hole completely disappears in a flash of radiation as it disappears to microscopic sizes. And we think that happens for every black hole. Yes, at different rates depending on the sizes, even supermassive black holes, even supermassive black holes with billions of solar masses, with trillions of solar masses, they will take an awful long time because the radiation is so weak to start with. But eventually, even those black holes will evaporate to nothing. It will take an awful lot longer than it would take, for instance, a stellar-sized black hole. It will take trillions of times longer, which is why our red box is now right over on the extreme right of this picture. So there will come a time when there is no matter left. If the only things we had were black holes, the black holes would evaporate. We're left with a universe full of radiation, light, if you like, radiation of different wavelengths, but nothing else. 10 to the power 100 is a Google. Uh, no, not that one. Uh, that one is a misspelling. Uh, the, the folklore goes that when they set up Google, they intended it to be that, but somebody wrote it down wrong and spelt it wrong. Uh, so that Google is nothing to do with this Google. 10 to the power 100 is a Google. And it's been calculated that after a Google years, the last black hole that we can conceive of should have evaporated to leave no matter in the universe at all. The universe is just full of radiation. So after this, nothing happens because there's no matter left. There's just radiation floating around and that's it. So you could argue if there's no matter left, there's no structures left, time becomes essentially meaningless because there's nothing you can watch. There's nothing happening other than little bits of microwave radiation floating around the universe, the so-called heat death of the universe. And just to remind us how stupid this number is, 10 to the power 100, I don't normally add zeros onto the end of ones to show you, but in the case of a Google, I think we really ought to. That is a Google. 10 thousand, million, 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 you can do it yourself. It's an awful lot of millions. Remember, we've got a thousand, we've got a million, we've got a billion, we've got a trillion. You can very quickly run out of the right adjectives to describe just how big this number is. But even though it's a ridiculous number that you can't conceive of in the sense that it's difficult even to think of a billion years, and that's how old the universe is, a billion years or 13.8 billion years. Of course, the human brain can't comprehend just how big a number that is. But that doesn't stop you doing the maths. It doesn't stop you calculating, yep, if I understand how black holes work, if I understand Hawking radiation, I can calculate how long it's going to take until there's nothing left in the universe. And the answer is approximately 10 to the power 100 years. So that's as close as we can get to the end of time. Strictly, the universe will continue expanding. The radiation that's floating around will get stretched further and further and further from microwaves into long radio waves, into really long radio waves. It'll just keep expanding. Nothing interesting is going to happen from this point onwards. So is this the end of time? Well, you could treat it as the end of time if you wanted to. Woody Allen definitely would. Eternity is a very long time, especially towards the end. But another way of uh, putting a, a slightly uh, lighter note onto the whole thing is a, is a cartoon I rather like called XKCD. They said, if you want to think about the meaning of life in a universe that's going to expand into nothing, uh, if you think about what a human is, a human is simply a system for converting dust billions of years ago into dust billions of years from now via a rather roundabout process, which involves checking email a lot, apparently. <laughs> but if the idea of a universe that will come to an end in a Google years and everything will just disappear and nothing interesting will happen from that point onwards, let me try and leave you with something a little bit more cheery with an epilogue. I believe we live in a golden age. The sun is middle-aged. Middle-aged, 
and well behaved. It's billions of years old, it's got billions of years ahead of it. The moon is at just the right distance to stabilize the Earth's axis and to stabilize the Earth's seasons, which is great for us. And as a bonus, it also allows us to see the spectacle of a total eclipse of the sun. That's just a little bit of a bonus which we get at the moment. Thanks to evolution operating for a few billion years, we, as humans, are able to explore and discover and ultimately understand the universe. And we can do that by visiting our closest neighbors, and we can do that by building telescopes that allow us to see trillions of galaxies at distances of billions of light years. We could not have done this in the very early universe because we needed to have all of the elements made by those generations of stars which processed hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, calcium, all the other heavy elements that make life the way we understand life. So we needed those generations of stars to do the preparation to allow us to be where we are today. And we've just seen that the future, well, the future, trillions of years from now, the universe will be very dark and very boring. So you could argue the best time to exist is, of course, now. Thank you all very much. Thank you.